Dr. Wilson is a teaching fellow at Regent College Vancouver. He previously served on the faculties of Westmont College, Acadia Divinity College, and Cary Theological College. Currently, he serves as the senior consultant for theological integration at Canadian Baptist Ministries and as adjunct supervisor at the International Baptist Theological Seminary and the Free University of Amsterdam. He has authored or edited uh, several volumes, including God So Loved the World, A Christology for Christian Disciples, Living Faithfully in a Fragmented World, From After Virtue to New Monasticism, and God's Good World, Reclaiming the Doctrine of Creation. He writes the lead theological integration article for each issue of Mosaic, the Canadian Baptist Magazine. And this evening, Dr. Wilson will speak on reclaiming the doctrine of creation for the health of the church. Good evening from Nanaimo, British Columbia, where my wife and I live in the Nanaimo River watershed on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish, Musqueam, and tsleil people, specifically the Sunamuk and Suminus nations have lived with this land uh, for centuries, perhaps millennia. Although I can't be there in person, I'm delighted to be with you virtually, and I look forward to a conversation following my presentation. I'm grateful to the president and the dean of Trinity School for Ministry, to Joel Scandrett, the director of the Weber Center uh, when, who first, uh, offer, first invited me uh, to give the, uh, this address at the conference in 2020, and to Jeff Mackey, who has now taken on that role and has guided me uh, through this time. I'm also thankful to Allison Martin, who has been so efficient in helping me uh, prepare for this as well. If people's diet is lacking in vitamin D, they may develop rickets. If they are lacking vitamin C, they may, suffer, they may suffer from scurvy. A diet lacking or being deficient in protein typically causes quasior core. For more than 250 years, the church in the West, or what we may now call the global North, has been fed a deficient biblical and theological diet. As a consequence, much of the church in the West or Global North is in poor health. You can tell from the title of my presentation that I am convinced that what is lacking in our theological diet is the doctrine of creation. In our current crises, we may be tempted to regard a recovery of the doctrine of creation in pragmatic and utilitarian terms. That is, we may seek the recovery of this doctrine as a means to solve our problems and avert a catastrophe. But that would actually be to approach things exactly backwards. We should not seek to recover the doctrine of creation as a tool for fixing things. That's what gets us into trouble, regarding God's gifts as tools for our use, rather than gifts for their proper enjoyment. The proper gospel-centered reason for recovering the doctrine of creation is to live more deeply into Christ and participate with God in the restoration of the health of the church so that our lives bear witness to God's gift and to our proper response to this gift. I've been deeply involved in creation itself for a long time. I won't tell that story now, but uh, when I was a teacher at Westmont College, where Sandra Richter uh, now teaches, my students struggled with life in their bodies, both women and men, in different ways. And I began to realize that they hadn't been taught a theology of the body. And then I began to realize that we don't even have a fundamental base doctrine of creation from which to uh, perform or teach a theology of the body. Now, a lot of work has been done on the body, and it's good work. Uh, but here's my contribution to all of that. So, we seek to understand the doctrine of creation so that we can bear witness to God's good gift and to our proper response to this gift. Our current crises have exposed a deficiency in our diet. Ameliorating that deficiency will bring God's people into a fuller more faithful living of the gospel. 
And when God's people live in faithfulness, then the healing that only God can bring may come into our world. One of the primary symptoms of our disease, among others, is our inability in Christian communities to have a biblical theological argument about public witness in areas such as race, economics, politics, sexuality, ecology, militarization, ancestors, and more. The pathologies that mark such communities, many of our communities, perhaps most, often make God's people a counter witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. These communities witness to fear, self-preservation, alienation from our neighbors, and revenge. This primary symptom and others cluster around at least three pathologies, low-grade Gnosticism, ideological captivity, and mission confusion. Much of the church suffers from a low-grade, sometimes a high-grade Gnostic fever. We separate spirit and matter. Spirit is the realm of the good, Matter is the realm of evil. A lot of preaching and teaching carelessly creates, sustains, and reinforces this Gnosticism, as do many hymns and worship songs. As a consequence, when we separate spirit and matter, our material lives come under the rule of forces other than Jesus Christ. We may proclaim a message of salvation, good news, with our words, but our deeds under the rule of other powers and principalities, creates a tsunami that wipes out the words that we speak. Thus, a second set of symptoms clusters around ideological captivity. When Christians do not have a mature, robust doctrine of creation integrated with our other convictions, then our life in the world is extremely vulnerable to ideological perversions of the gospel. If we have not been shown, and if we do not show others, how to live in the world as God's creation, then our economic, political, social, sexual lives will be ruled by principalities and powers. Ideological captivity is an equal opportunity disease. It will invade wherever it finds a weakness. Indeed, one sign of our vulnerability to ideologies is our facility in typing various Christian communities, left-wing, right-wing, conservative, progressive, libertarian, and so on. It is tragic comic, maybe simply tragic, that the church's public presence and witness are known more often by our political affiliation to a party rather than to the kingdom of God. A third set of symptoms clusters around our confusion about the mission of God's people. Two points of tension are clear in current discussions. One is our commitment to ecological action. More and more Western Christians are beginning to acknowledge the damage that we have done to God's creation, including humankind. But actions and reactions are typically guided by pragmatic considerations about our future and by the same Promethean myth that got us here. We created the problem, therefore we can solve it. Moreover, creation care is sometimes offered as an option to the gospel. Like an upgraded stereo system in a new car, creation may increase our enjoyment of life with God, but it is still optional. The second point of tension in our mission confusion is what has historically been framed as the relationship between evangelism and social action. There was a time in history around Lausanne 1 and following when such a frame was necessary. But in many quarters, we have, been become, we have become bewitched by this way of stating the issue. In its extreme, this bewitchment leads to other forms of captivity and reductions that once again make the church sick and incapable of joyful invitational witness to the whole gospel. When we do not have a clear mission rooted in and growing out of God's work of creation, we have a tendency to reduce the gospel and become either word people or deed people. We need a healthy theological diet that includes creation 
in order to heal our low-grade Gnosticism, free us from our ideological captivities, and clear up our mission confusion. So much for the differential diagnosis. Now, let us go boldly forward to provide the theological food often lacking in the Western Church and elsewhere. As I add creation to our meal plans, I hope that you will see how pleasing and beautiful and even tasty the gospel is when we add this one thing that has been lacking. And so to reclaiming the doctrine of creation. Here we will happily be ancient future in a way. First, note that the condition of creation is something that we have inherited from our near and far ancestors. When we acknowledge the increasing devastation of life that results from human activity, we may be tempted to lay it almost entirely at the feet of modernity. To an extent, we must resist this tempt temptation. Yes, some aspects of modernity have accelerated and deepened the devastation of life. But the problem is more ancient than a, the last few hundred years. As to the future, we are becoming ancestors to those who will come after us. We must ask what their future is, not just environmentally, but theologically. Our present crises reveal to us the cosmic contest that has been won by Jesus Christ, but continues to this day. Our ecological crises are one battleground in this contest. Even if we somehow found the actions and will to overcome our ecological crises, but did not recognize these crises as a call to right alignment with our Creator and Redeemer, it would profit us nothing. To reclaim the doctrine of creation as the story of the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we will draw from that most ancient well, Holy Scripture. And who knows? Some new treasure may be awaiting us. As we do this, we must listen to what the Spirit is saying to the people of God. We must learn how we came to this place and time and offer an ancient future faith for living in these times and onward that, first, glorifies the Creator God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Second, makes disciples of Jesus the Messiah in the whole of life and in all relationships. And third, bears witness in word and deed to the good news of Jesus Christ for all things. In our work, we will be following in the footsteps of the early teachers of the church by seeking to exercise the pastoral function of Christian doctrine, as Ellen Cherry taught us. And, I will add, the missional function of Christian doctrine. In God's good world, I mix together three ingredients necessary to reclaiming the doctrine of creation for the health of the church. Fully integrating the work of God in creation and redemption, what I call there the dialectic of the kingdom, which I talked about this morning. Practicing the Trinitarian grammar of creation, and rereading Scripture as the story of Jesus Christ, through whom and for whom all things are created. That's the heart of God's good world as I now understand it. This morning, I presented a portion of those ingredients and set them in a context slightly different from the book. I encourage you to read the book for yourselves. When I first started writing books, I thought I shouldn't promote them. I thought that would be an act of pride, but then I realized if I didn't think they were worth reading, I shouldn't publish them. And if I thought they were worth reading, I should encourage people to do that. So that helped me take care and resist pride. The second thing I thought is that promoting my books would be uh, maybe an act of greed. And then I realized that I make about a dollar for every book that I sell. And that took care or helped me resist the sin of greed. So, I encourage you to read the book. Tonight, however, I am going to tell the story of creation in another way. To recover the doctrine of creation for the health of the church, I will later 
tonight invite you to the practice of convivience. Convivience is the repentant, joyful, communal life that becomes a reality when our lives are joined to the life of the Creator. I grew up in Southern revivalism. You always ended a sermon, and this is going to get close to a sermon, you always ended a sermon with an invitation. So be ready for it. To enter into this life of convivience, we must first listen to the story of creation. To tell the story of creation in a way that we might hear it anew and enter into a life of convivience, I invite you to see and hear creation as comedy, tragedy, and fairy tale. Some of you may recognize or recall uh, Frederick Beekner's uh, lectures on preaching uh, published as Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, Fairy Tale. I have creatively appropriated that scheme, but I've changed it. It's the story of creation, and I have reversed the order of tragedy and comedy, and you'll see why in a few minutes. Tragedy, comedy, and fairy tale. In telling the story this way, I aim to recover for today the vision and practices that I have learned from the early teachers of the church. Bob Weber and I almost became colleagues at Northern Seminary, and this conference honors his vision. Bob and I had a long lunch together and talked about the projects that we might work on if we were colleagues. One of the things that we talked about was the little book that was one of the last, perhaps the last book that Bob published, Who Gets to Narrate the World? So tonight, let's see what this narrative of creation as comedy, tragedy, and fairy tale can teach us. We begin with the comedy of creation. One of the mistakes that we have often perpetuated is to begin with tragedy, as Beekner does. After all, isn't that the story we live in? Look around you. It's tragic. And so after a brief nod to Genesis 1 and 2, we get on to the main story that begins in Genesis 3, tragedy. But that isn't where Scripture begins. In the beginning, God. And the first two chapters of the story are not tragedy. I noted that this insight is rooted in some of the early teachers of the church this morning. But consider, think about Genesis 1. What? God just spoke and it happened? If we weren't so caught up in anxieties about this text, we would laugh our way through reading these chapters. Wait a minute, you can't create light before there's a source of light? Oh, he just did. And look at how it all fits together, how wonderful, how delightful. It brings a smile to my face, and it should. And the story of Ha'adam, the man trying to find a companion, companion among the animals, how funny is that? And then Creator makes a companion from the man's own body, and the two are to become one. If we had time for a leisurely comparison of Genesis to the Babylonian account of the beginnings of this world, in something called the Enuma Elish, the comedy of Genesis would be even more striking. A brief comparison will have to suffice. In Enuma Elish, this world has its origins in a little family spat among the gods. As the generation of the gods collide in violence, the death of one god results in her body being shaped into the world we have today, and the blood of another god being used to form humankind in order to free the gods from the burden of caring for this accidental world. It's a story of chaos, burden, violence, jealousy, plots and counterplots, betrayal and killing. There are times when we would laugh at how petty the gods are, but we would be laughing in terror that this might just be the story of the world. Now think of Genesis 1 and 2. Order, blessing, peace, harmony, goodness. In short, creation. And what about the comedy of Genesis 1, 26 through 31? Really? The Creator hands over responsibility to two creatures? 
Now, that's funny. Why would the Creator, who has brought into being something so special and beautiful, assign its care to two creatures? They are part of the story. Their lives depend on relationships to one another, the rest of creation, and self, and most of all to God. How can they be in charge? It's enough to make you laugh. Wisdom knows how delightful this is. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so that the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in humankind. So also the psalmists and many of the prophets. But here's the biggest joke in this comedy. The people who begin their scriptures with this story, this comedy, had lived their entire lives in a world filled with tragedy. They had never experienced creation as comedy. How then do they come to believe that the way the world is today, violent, chaotic, burdensome, and death-ruled, is not the way the world always has been or the way it is meant to be? In other words, why isn't the Israelite story of how this world came into existence something more like Enuma Elish? Doesn't Enuma Elish have more explanatory power? Well, yes, except that Yahweh has caught them up as God's people and has begun to guide them toward order, blessing, harmony, peace, life, all the things rightly aligned with the Creator and one another. And so they believed. Now that's the comedy of creation. And that leads us to the origin of all the comedy of creation. In the beginning, God. There is only one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Then there's also the world. Once there was not a people of God, now there is. Creation from nothing is the most wonderful, wonderful reality that we could never imagine. Earlier today, Paul Blowers led us into this mystery with guidance from the early church fathers and showed us the significance of creatio ex nihilo for us today. But at this point, we will stop talking about the comedy of creation and turn to creation as, as tragedy. For Genesis 1 and 2 are followed by Genesis 3 and the brokenness that is the story of Israel and the coming of the Messiah. This brokenness is a sign of our enslavement to principalities and powers that are intended by God for life, but now serve death. They take life from us. In Genesis 3, the chaos and violence and alienation that is present from the beginning in the Babylonian creation story erupts in Israel's creation story. It's important to note the order of things. First, the comedy of creation, then the tragedy. Enuma Elish operates with the conviction that the way things are today is the way things always have been and always will be. Genesis reveals that the way things are today, chaotic, violent, burdensome, death-ruled, are not the way things always have been. And that's not the end of the story. Let's pursue greater clarity as we consider creation as tragedy. What was once harmonious, orderly, blessing, life-giving, is now fraught with unending conflict, unmanageable chaos, manifold burdens, and the rule of death. This is indeed a tragedy of cosmic proportion. All of creation bears the crushing weight of this tragedy. We could say that tragedy becomes our story because we humans fail to see and accept and live our lives in the comedy of redemption, of creation, in the comedy of creation. We believe a different story and become captive to death. 
we who are God's people bear this burden and lament. We cry out, we sob, we plead for justice and mercy. We confess our burning hatred and dreams of payback. We do all of this as lament directed toward the one who we believe is responsible for the original comedy of creation because we know that the circumstances, events, emotions that give rise to our speech, all that causes our lament is the mark of creation as tragedy. If creation had not begun as a comedy, what we experience today would not be a tragedy. It would simply be the way things are. So our lament is also an act of confession. The world should not be this way. And we lament our part in the brokenness. As an act of confession, it is a cry for the wholeness of life that is the gift of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Our lament also witnesses to our trust. Lament is properly lament only if it is directed to the Creator God. In lament, then, we bear witness to the one who is with us in tragedy, hears our cries, and makes things right. Such a hope arises from the conviction that the way things are is not the way they are cre created to be. It arises from belief in the comedy of creation. Lament teaches us that what is wrong is not merely a human tragedy that we humans might possibly make right. Lament teaches us that we are in the midst of the tragedy of creation. Only Creator can make things right. Lament is the practice which the Creator can, by which the Creator continually reintegrates us with life that He has given to creation and with our mission as God's people. Our witness as God's people in lament is to bring the realities of this tragedy into our practice of lament. Let us lament the loss of so many plants and animals that have been a part of the comedy of creation. Let us lament human greed and injustice and fear that deepens the tragedy of creation. Let us lament the loss of lives that results from our commodification of the gifts that God has given. And in all our work to align our lives and all of creation with God's purpose, lament sustains us even when the brokenness breaks us. But lament also realigns us with creation and the life that God gives. So lament is not the end of our mission, but it's restoration. The story of Job is the means by which God reclaimed me when I was a lost 21-year-old. It is also the story that brings things together at this point. Job's story does not explain suffering. Rather, it invites, urges us into a different story altogether. Tragedy marks Job's life, and he laments. Oh, he laments. Even after his friends tell him he has no right to lament, he keeps on. Lament after lament. Anger, pleading, accusing, weeping, loathing. The tragedy and lamentation of Job stretches out for 36 chapters. Except that strange, anomalous chapter 28, the hymn to creation. What is that doing in the middle of all this tragedy and lament? Well, it's doing exactly what we've been learning. We can recognize our circumstances in the tragedy of creation only by locating tragedy as a subplot an intruder in the comedy of creation. In spite of how it feels to us in the midst of, tra of tragedy, tragedy makes only a cameo appearance in the story of creation. This is not to dismiss or trivialize tragedy and trauma or e and evil, but to locate these as scripture does. Think of Romans 8, 18 to 21. I do not consider our present sufferings worth comparing, Paul says. The story of Job drives this home in chapters 38 to 41. Surely this is high comedy in the story of creation. And Dr. Richter led us into some of the text this morning. The possibility that Job would know the answers to creator's questions is laughable. And the pictures of creator and creation should cause delight. Job gets it. So also does Jonas Musamba, a pastor in the North Kivu province of DR Congo. 
His work is based in Goma, where the volcano, uh, volcano Mount Niryangogo recently erupted. But in recent history, North Kivu has also been a place of genocide and horrendous evil. Pastor Musamba struggled with being present in the midst of so much deep trauma and longed to bring some healing. In his creative thinking, he considered the four relationships in Genesis 1, 26 through 31, for which humans are created, with God, with one another, with non-human creation, and with self. As he sought God's wisdom, he learned that healing does not begin with a relationship with God, since God seems to have abandoned the victims. Nor can it begin by establishing a relationship with other humans, because other humans inflicted the horrendous evils and trauma. And it could not begin with self, because most trauma victims create or project a false self in order to survive. Pastor Musamba, now the Reverend Dr. Jonas Musamba, learned that the healing of trauma and the restoration of broken relationships begins with a gradual restoration of the relationship with the rest of creation. A pleasing fragrance, a cooling breeze, lush vegetation, a cacophony of animal life. These things begin the process of healing as traumatized bodies become once again mediators of goodness. As the book of Job teaches, there is a wisdom of the Creator manifest in creation that is deeper than the so-called wisdom that purports to guide us through this tragic existence. In Job's final speech, he repents. His repentance is rooted in his realization that although his lament was justified, he did not know that his story, his tragedy, was part of a larger story, the story that the Creator teaches him and us in chapters 38 through, through 41. God rejects the words of Job's friends because they denied the tragedy of creation. Job, uh, God affirms Job's words because Job clung tenaciously to the reality of the tragedy of creation. What Job caught a glimpse of and what caused his repentance is the greater story that he and we are part of. The ending of Job that has puzzled and troubled so many points us back and propels us forward. After Job has prayed, had prayed for his friends, the Lord, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died, an old man and full of years. If creation begins as a comedy disrupted by tragedy, then its telos is a fairy tale? Isn't that an apt description of the end of Job? Job died an old man and full of years. What an epitaph. But that's not quite the fairy tale ending, is it? They live happily ever after. That's the fairy tale ending. Here is a good place to be reminded that we are not fitting creation into some preset notion of comedy, tragedy, and fairy tale as if creation is just the best version of each of these. Instead, I am using each of these to pierce through the assumptions about the story or stories that we are caught up in. My purpose is to uncover and reclaim our convictions about creation for the health of the church. Perhaps this is clearest when we consider creation as fairy tale. Creation as fairy tale is incredible, but not unreal. In Greek drama, comedy typically ends in a bacchanal. Everything has turned out all right. Let's party. Let's live. Creation as fairy tale offers a different ending, a different celebration. In J.R.R. Tolkien's classic essay on fairy stories, he offers a compelling account of the Christian story as eucatastrophe. Yes, that's right. But what is missing in Tolkien's count, perhaps unexpectedly, is the comedy of creation. For him, tragedy is the highest form of drama, 
and new catastrophe resolves tragedy. But again, how do we recognize tragedy if we don't have comedy? New catastrophe is not merely the overcoming of tragedy. It is the final end of comedy. In the biblical story, the apocalypse of John does the job of fairy story. It teaches us to see our world in a new way. Creation as fairy tale of a sort is offered to us in a series of visions in chapter 17 through 21 of John's Revelation. These chapters do not give us a chronological sequence of events. Rather, they offer a series of visions that teach us to see our world now in light of its telos. We will consider three of these visions. The first is the fall of Babylon. In the Israelite imagination, rooted in history, Babylon stands for all the violence, chaos, brokenness, and evil of this world. We have already seen that such a world is the vision of Enuma Elish, the founding story of Babylonia. So, John's vision of the fall of Babylon is the end, the erasing of the broken, tragic world that has only briefly interrupted the comedy of creation. The second vision is the wedding feast of the Lamb, creation's alternative or the Creator's alternative to the Bacchanal. In this wedding feast, we have all of the good gifts of Genesis 1 and 2 claimed as the destiny of all creation, harmony, order, blessing, gift giving, the fullness of life in holiness. All sin and evil is washed away. What a glorious vision. The third vision is an extensive description of the new heaven and earth. This is the fairy tale ending we long for, but is so much more than a fairy tale ending. All creation is caught up in something more than living happily ever after. Let's remind ourselves of four things. First, God makes all things new, not all new things. The stuff of this new heaven and earth is the stuff of the comedy of creation made new. Second, the Creator comes once again to dwell in creation, just as Genesis 2 declared. Third, there is a city and a garden. The city, built with the beauty of creation, welcomes the wealth of the nations and the glory of kings, all the best of human creativity, but nothing vile. And the garden is once again open to us, where the tree of life brings healing to all peoples. This tree of life is almost certainly the cross of Jesus Christ, now the source of healing. Fourth, each vision in chapters 17 through 22, and this one most particularly, is a vision of the one who was dead and is alive forevermore the Alpha and the Omega, through whom and for whom all things are made and under whom all things are brought into unity. It may feel like we have arrived at a stopping point, but Revelation, the apocalypse, doesn't stop here. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes Take the free gift of the water of life. And so we are invited, I invite you, into what I call convivience. This joyful life that comes from changing our minds about this world and our disposition toward it. A Numa Elish is wrong. It's not a true story. And all the variations on its story and all the ways that follow from such stories are wrong. They deal in alienation and violence, sin and death. The repentant, celebratory, joyful life of convivience begins when we turn from the ways of death and walk in the way of life. As we learn this way, we enter into the joy of relationships and the healing that begins on the way. Convivience is better than comedy. It's the way that the comedy of creation reaches its eternal fulfillment. Convivience is beyond the reach of tragedy because convivience is the making new of all things. 
Convivience is more ecstatic than a fairy tale because in the ecstasy of convivience, it's not the prince and princess that live happily ever after. It's all creation in relationship with the Creator. Moreover, in the ecstasy of convivience, all things created become their true selves in full communion with all others. This is the giving and receiving that fulfills the comedy of creation. This is the life of the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and the life of Creator that gives to all, the life that the Creator gives to all things. As almost an aside, it is remarkable to me that few of our conversations about earth and the crises we face give consideration to this beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Surely Jesus is teaching us something about the comedy of creation, the life of giving and receiving, not taking and keeping, that may be a, and should be a guide to us in the midst of our present crises. The communion that is convivience includes God, other humans, the rest of creation, and self. This is the wholeness of life, and it is cause for celebration. We are now back to the healing of the church and clearing the body of disease. The story of creation teaches us that all things begin and end in the goodness of God. There is no other source of things away then with Gnosticism. The story of creation exposes the false ideologies that take us captive to the covert and sometimes overt rule of death. When we meet tragedy with lament, we give to God all that the tragedy of creation induces in us. Through much lament and long hard work, we submit our violence, vengeance, alienation, fears, and guilt to God. We leave the tragedy of creation in God's hands and we walk free of alienating, soul-crushing, death-dealing ideologies. Our current struggles to bear, bear public witness in some of the places I noted at the beginning of this presentation should shock us with the revelation that we need to be reclaimed by the doctrine of creation, or as I put it this morning, the gospel of creation. As we walk into the life of convivience, our mission as God's people becomes clear. In the comedy of creation, God calls first, God's first people to four relationships. In the tragedy of creation, these relationships are broken. Sorrow, suffering, pain, and death follow. In creation as fairy tale, sort of, the tragedy of creation passes away and the comedy of creation reaches its fulfillment. So the life of the people of God in convivience is simply the gift once again to fulfill the mission that God gave, God gave God's first people, to live in full, harmonious, life-giving exchange with God, other humans, non-human creation, and self. To take one immediate example, in this call to convivience, we care for creation by seeking the fulfillment of the purpose of creation, not because we can fix the problems of creation. Only the Creator can bring and has brought healing to our broken, death-ruled world. This is God's good world. It is creation. To seek the fulfillment of the rest of creation in convivience leads us to the recognition that the rest of, con of creation also gives life to us and through us and our rightly aligned lives gives life to other humans. To give up our lives in service to the rest of creation because we are serving Creator is to find our lives. Such giving bears witness to and participates in the telos of all things in God. Reclaiming or better, being reclaimed by the doctrine of creation, calls us to practice convivience because it is the mission that God gives us. Through our lives of convivience, rightly aligned with God, we will become people who give life to other humans, to non-human creation, and even to self. 
And in this giving, we will also receive life. I leave you tonight with something else to ponder. All that I have really been describing this evening is true worship of one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, created life as convivience beyond comedy, tragedy, and fairy tale, is reenacted whenever we worship. Praise and thanksgiving, lament and confession, assurance and pardon, the unity that we witness to every time we come to the table, the stuff of creation, bread and wine, as the means by which the gift of Christ is received by us, our giving of our bodies for this time and these practices of worship. This is the most real world made new and given by the one creator, Father, Son, and Spirit. May we be reclaimed by this reality for the health of our communities and our witness. Thank you. Thank you.